In this lecture, you will learn many of the key ideas and events of the age of Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson was president of the United States, and he kind of dominated politics and culture for the period of his presidency and also kind of decades after. At the end of this lecture, you need to be able to identify and describe political participation, political parties, spoil system, the national bank debate, the American system, nullification, the Maysville Road veto, the Indian Removal Act, and the Trail of Tears. You also need to be able to explain the consequences of certain landmark Supreme Court cases like McCulloch v. Maryland, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, and Worcester v. Georgia. Explain how the Seminole resisted removal and remained in Florida in the Second Seminole War. So we want to start off with the election before Jackson gets elected but where he runs for president. In the election of 1824, there's a lot of controversy. There are four candidates for president in this election. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, who is the son of John Adams, the second president of the United States, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. Now, because there's four candidates for president, nobody has a clear majority of the electoral votes, although Andrew Jackson does get the largest share of the popular vote. Because no one has a majority of the electoral votes, the House of Representatives has to decide who's going to become the president. Normally, the House would select from the top three candidates, William Crawford being the one with the third most votes, but he ends up having a stroke and doesn't make a real good candidate for president. So that leaves Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Now, Henry Clay is very ambitious. He's also the Speaker of the House at the time. He's going to make uh, a deal with John Quincy Adams that if he can sway enough votes in the House so that John Quincy Adams gets elected instead of Jackson, who's probably the guy who would get elected, then he will make Henry Clay his Secretary of State. And Secretary of State back then was a, a surefire stepping stone to the presidency. When Jackson and his supporters end up losing this vote in the House, they're going to be furious. They're going to end up forming a new political party, the Democratic Party. This is basically the same Democratic Party that exists today. This is when it was founded. Now, John Quincy Adams is going to have a miserable presidency, uh, aside from the fact that he tried to be a president just like his father and try and show everybody that his dad was doing it the right way when his dad wasn't doing it the right way. He's also going to be harassed by Jackson and his supporters constantly. They're going to spread scandals and rumors about one another. It's going to be a very ugly, miserable presidency. By the election of 1828, you have Jackson and his supporters, who are now the Democratic Party, and Adams' supporters are being known as the National Republicans. Now, suffrage means the right to vote. And don't confuse this word, because a lot of times when kids hear suffrage, they think it sounds like suffer and it must be a bad thing. Suffering is a bad thing, but suffrage is a good thing. That's the right to vote. And the right to vote is going to change a lot by the election of 1828. You no longer needed to own land in order to vote. Basically, by this time, all free white men could vote in the United States. No women could vote, no Native Americans could vote, no African Americans could vote. But if you were a free white man, you could probably vote. And that's going to change around the dynamic of the election. Also, the popular vote actually matters at this point. Many of the states start tying the popular vote to how they distribute electoral votes. So no longer are the electors just picking whoever they want. Now they're designated and assigned to whatever political party they support. And the popular vote actually starts to matter. Now I'd like you to go ahead and pause your video. Do practice Number one, these are true-false statements. Mark them true or false. If they are false statements, go into the statement and figure out which words or wording you can change around to make it a true statement and do that on your worksheet now. So Andrew Jackson is going to handily defeat John Quincy Adams in the election of 1828. He's going to become the second, seventh president of the United States, and he's going to serve from 1829 to 1837. Now, to give you a little bit of background about Andrew Jackson, the real Andrew Jackson, he was born in 1767 in South Carolina. He was very much a self-made man. He was born in a little cabin, uh, became a lawyer, a legislator, and also a wealthy slave owner. 
he really rises to the national spotlight with the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812, even though it occurs technically after the war is over, he's going to be heralded as this great national hero. He's going to be a national celebrity, kind of like George Washington was after the American Revolution. He's also going to fight to remove Creek Indians from Tennessee and Seminole Indians from Florida. And he's definitely somebody who feels like Native Americans and Indians needed to be moved out of land that would be useful to white America that was spreading across the continent at that time. He had won the election of 1824 in popular votes, but not in electoral votes. So by the time he becomes president, he's a very bitter, angry guy with regards to his political rivals. He is a populist president, which means he's a politician who tries to appeal to ordinary people who feel like their problems have been ignored by the established elites of society, the rich people, the powerful people in government. He's really claiming to be a champion of the common man, which is kind of strange because he himself was a very wealthy guy. He was a slave owner in Tennessee. He owned a large plantation called the Hermitage. You know, if your house has a name, that it's pretty big. That's a picture of his house right there. In terms of his personality, he is he was extremely bossy. Um, he did not like to listen to other people's opinions. He could be very temperamental. He would fly off the handle, get extremely angry. He's also someone who doesn't tolerate other people's advice. He always feels like he is right and everybody else needs to do exactly what he wants. He's also a very confrontational person. He never walks away from a fight, both a physical fight or a verbal confrontation. He thrives on making personal enemies of his competitors and his rivals. Now do practice number two. Mark the following statements, true or false. If the statements are false, go ahead and change the statements to true statements by changing the wording of the sentence. Andrew Jackson's inauguration is very unusual. Adams' supporters tended to be very wealthy, whereas Jackson's supporters were more middle and low income. And his victory really shows that the common man is starting to gain political power in the United States from the rich and well-born. And a lot of it is because their votes actually matter now in the elections. They actually have a real say in picking who's in charge. His inauguration turns into this rowdy party. And I have a statement from a witness. This is a primary source statement. And it describes what she saw. But what a scene did we witness? The majesty of the people had disappeared, and a rabble, a mob of boys, negroes, women, children, scrambling, fighting, romping. What a pity, what a pity. No arrangements had been made, no police officers placed on duty, and the whole house had been inundated by the rabble mob. We came too late. So the White House basically got destroyed by this rowdy party of all the common folk, celebrating the election of Andrew Jackson. Sounds almost like a riot with the fact that no police officers had shown up or anything like that. So the spoils system. Now Jackson, when he takes office, he feels like the government is filled with workers who had supported the previous president, John Quincy Adams. And he doesn't like John Quincy Adams. He doesn't trust anybody who used to work for him. He doesn't want any of these supporters. So he ends up firing basically all of them. And he puts into place a system that historians often refer to as the spoils system. And basically how it worked is if you were a Jackson political supporter, you were going to be rewarded with a government job. Now, often those who were awarded with the position weren't exactly qualified for the job or even held accountable for doing the work that was associated with the job. Basically, it was a way to reward them with a paycheck from the government for their support. Here's practice number three, true, false. Chain, mark the statements as true or false statements. If the statements are false statements, change the wording around to make it a true statement. So we need to take a look at Jack Jackson's economic policies because they're going to be very important during the time period that he's president. 
Now, he's going to believe the government should not be involved in the economy. And he really is following along with the ideas that Jefferson put in place, like this laissez-faire policy of being hands-off with the economy and with individual rights. Jackson himself was strongly against banks um, incurring a national debt and any unnecessary taxes. He's definitely someone who subscribes to the philosophy as a small government. The first major economic issue of his presidency is a tariff, a tax, which he labels the tariff of abominations. Abomination is a name you give to something, a description you give to something that's frightening or terrifying. Now, the northern states wanted tariffs to protect their industries from foreign competition. Now, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. And what a tariff does is it raises the cost of those cheap imported goods and allows an American company to be more price competitive. So that even though if the overseas product is cheaper to make, the tariff raises its cost and makes it more expensive to buy in the United States. Usually that extra tax is passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices. So these northern states wanted the tariffs because it would help protect them from cheap foreign competition. This law was passed while John Quincy Adams was president. He was certainly a strong supporter of the tariffs. This tariff is going to anger the southern states. <clears throat> they thought it was going to hurt their economy. The southern states at this time are very focused on growing plantation and, or growing cotton in plantation agriculture and exporting that. They don't really manufacture a lot of products. So most of the manufactured goods that they need, they have to import. So they want to get it from the cheapest place they can. And if that isn't the North and it happens to be some overseas company, then they want to get it from overseas. The tariffs are going to interfere with that. So for the Southern states, this is not a good thing. The whole process of this tariff is going to add lots of the fuel to the fire that's growing in between the North and the South at this time. They're gradually sort of separating and pulling themselves apart. They're starting to disagree on a lot of things. This process of the region starting to differ politically is referred to as sectionalism. That's where the North is looking out for the North's interests, the Southern states are looking out for the Southern states' interests, and they're not really working together very well. <clears throat> This is going to bring us to the nullification crisis, and this is probably one of Jackson's bigger achievements as president. So, at least a positive achievement, we'll say. Now, some of the southern states, like South Carolina, thought that the states should hold more power than the national government. They wanted to be able to nullify or cancel any national laws that they did not like, such as the Tariff of Abominations. And it's really a throwback back to the old Articles of Confederation. They want the states to be more powerful than the national government. Jackson is going to strongly oppose this idea as he truly believed that the national government was supreme over the state governments. This is going to bring into play his vice president, John C. Calhoun. That's a picture of John C. Calhoun over there. He looks like one of those paintings in the haunted mansion. He's a little creepy looking. He was from South Carolina himself, and tariffs had badly damaged his state's economy. He's going to become the leader of these supporters of nullification, and they're going to say that any of Congress's laws should not favor the North over the South. So this is a vice president who's going against his own vice, his own president, and this is not just any president, this is Andrew Jackson. He does not tolerate people who are disloyal or have different opinions. South Carolina itself is going to threaten to secede from the United States, which means that they're going to withdraw from the United States and form their own country. Jackson, in probably typical Jackson fashion, when confronted with opposition, he is going to respond in kind. He's going to threaten to raise an army and march on South Carolina if they try and secede. He also basically says if he finds John C. Calhoun, down there, he's going to hang him from the nearest tree. And Jackson is the type who would have done it. 
South Carolina is going to back down in the face of this threat from Jackson, and Calhoun himself is going to resign as the vice president. He's still going to end up being a powerful member of Congress because South Carolina is going to keep electing him to Congress. But it's going to basically shut down this whole nullification crisis. And Jackson probably prevented a civil war by issuing this threat and making it believable. Later on, in the term, we're going to learn about South Carolina seceding a second time. And when they secede the second time, the president at the time is a guy named James Buchanan, and he doesn't do anything. He lets them secede, and it builds momentum for other southern states to secede and causes a civil war. So more than likely, Jackson probably prevented a civil war here. All right, here's practice number four, true-false. Mark the statements as true-false. If they are false statements, change them over to true statements. Second major economic issue of Jackson's presidency was the National Bank. He opposed the idea of a national bank. He believed it only helped wealthy businessmen and that it was an unconstitutional extension of the power of Congress. He really felt that the National Bank had only benefited the national government in allowing them to borrow lots of money, and he didn't like the idea of borrowing lots of money. So he wanted to eliminate the avenue that the national government could borrow money, and that's the National Bank. He's going to end up vetoing the National Bank, and it's going to be challenged in the court system. The Supreme Court is going to rule that the National Bank is constitutional in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. So you need to make sure that you remember that that name, that case, McCulloch v. Maryland, is associated with the national bank debate with Jackson. So this brings us back to Henry Clay, who ran for president. He ran for president a bunch of times, actually. He always ends up losing, and he's always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Now, he's going to continue to be a powerful figure in American politics. So we learned that he was Speaker of the House and then became Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams. After John Quincy Adams' term is over, and it appears that Henry Clay is not going to be the next president because Andrew Jackson wins, he's going to end up being a senator for his home state of Kentucky during Jackson's presidency. And the man is very influential in Congress for decades. He's going to promote a legislative agenda that he calls the American system. And the goal of the American system was trying to minimize American dependence on foreign trade. And it was this dependence that resulted in the disastrous effects of Jefferson's embargo that we learned about in the last unit. So there were really three main goals of the American system. Number one, he wanted the federal government to invest in creating transportation infrastructure to allow the nation to be more self-sufficient. Basically, improve the transportation system so that goods and services can be sold in between states and not necessarily have to be transported back and forth across oceans. In order to do this, he supported the idea of a national bank that would allow the federal government the means to borrow and fund greater spending on internal improvements like railroads or canals. Finally, he wanted to utilize more protective tariffs to protect American products from foreign competition. He wanted the states to rely more on one another, even if it was more expensive for the states. All of this meant that the federal government should be su supporting financially the building of canals and roads and railroads and bridges, all these things that would tie the country together. Now this brings us to one of Jackson's more famous vetoes, the Maysville Road veto. Now, Henry Clay thought the federal government should financially support and plan the building of canals and roads, railroads and bridges. One good example of this at the time that was very successful was the Erie Canal in New York. Now, the Erie Canal connected the Great Lakes to the Hudson River, which then connected to New York City, and then the Atlantic, and allowed goods to be transported from all across the Midwest all the way to New York by water. This is going to dramatically lower the transportation costs, and it was a huge benefit to the economies of not just New York, but the country as a whole. In 1830, Henry Clay was promoting federal funding for the Maysville Road Project in his home state of Kentucky. So this is a road that's only going to be in Kentucky. 
Jackson is going to veto this bill, and when he vetoes it, he argues that the federal government should not be involved in economic affairs. This is your laissez-faire policy, and federal money should be used, if there's extra money available, should you be used to pay down the national debt and not fund some road project in one state. Historians have also argued that his veto on this might have been because of Clay himself. Andrew Jackson regarded Clay as a personal enemy for his involvement in the election of 1824, and that probably also contributed a little bit to his decision. So for practice number five, true, false, mark the following statements as true or false. If they are false statements, change them to true statements. This brings us to Indian removal, which is probably the biggest black spot on the record of Andrew Jackson. Now, Jackson had long been an advocate of removing Native Americans from land that was desired by white settlers. And we've already seen how as an army general, he fought to remove the Creek Indians from Alabama and Georgia, and also the Seminole Indians from Florida. He signed the Indian Removal Act in 1830. And this was a law that basically set out to move Indians out of valuable cotton producing land in the Southeast where they lived to what was a less desirable location, at least for white American settlers, in the Indian Territory, which is located in modern-day Oklahoma. The Native Americans who did not cooperate with the removal, they were removed by force. And this journey where they traveled from the southeast over to where Oklahoma is today, Indians reference this as the Trail of Tears. Tens of thousands made this march, almost 1,200 miles to Indian Territory. When they left, they were forced to abandon their belongings, their homes, businesses that they had. It was poorly supervised and funded by the United States. Thousands of the Native Americans died from exposure to the weather, starvation, diseases. Now, a lot of these native tribes, they were tricked. A few of them fought. One of them tried to use the legal system to try and protect their ownership of their land in Georgia. And this was the Cherokee. Now, the Cherokee had uh, uh, adopted white American culture. They had tried to assimilate as a way to sort of blend in and adapt to white American ways. They spoke English, they practiced Christianity, they operated plantations, and they owned slaves. But unfortunately, gold is going to be discovered on their land, in addition to the fact that it was valuable cotton producing land. The state of Georgia is going to take some steps to try and remove them from this land. And when the state of Georgia does this, the Cherokee are going to use the court system to try and protect their property rights as American citizens should. In the cases of Cherokee v. Georgia and Worcester v. Georgia, the Supreme Court actually rules in favor of the Cherokee and it says that they should not be removed from their land by the state of Georgia. Andrew Jackson is going to ignore this ruling by the court. And he's, there's a famous quote where he says something to the effect of, well, they've made their ruling, now let me see them enforce it. And he's basically challenging them, using a loophole in the system of checks and balances. And he's going to send federal troops to Georgia, and he's going to remove the Cherokee by force. More than 5,000 of the Cherokee are going to die on the Trail of Tears. Here you can see a map with the areas where these native tribes had lived in dark green. You have the Cherokee here in this area of Georgia, the Creek Indians in Alabama, the Choctaw and Chickasaw in Mississippi, also the Seminole Indians in Florida. And they made their journeys over land. You can see the trails here in the orange and in the red. The Seminole were confined to a reservation inside central Florida, and we're going to talk about the Seminole in a minute, the Seminole that were removed, many of them were removed from where we live in Tampa, taken across the ocean, or the Gulf of Mexico rather, to New Orleans, and then shipped up along the Mississippi and along the trails. So for practice number six, more true false statements, mark the following statements as true or false. If they are false statements, change them to true statements. This brings us to the Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. The Seminole are not going to go to the Indian Territory quietly. Now, 
The Treaty of Moultrie Creek in 1823 had, and this is something that happened after the first Seminole War, had required all the Seminole Indians to move to a reservation inside central Florida that you can see on this map in kind of this pinkish color. The Treaty of Payne's Landing in 1832 was set up to try and move the native Seminole Indians from this res reservation in central Florida to the Indian Territory. Several of the Seminole Creeks or Seminole chiefs agreed to this. Other Seminole Indians alleged that the chiefs were tricked or forced into agreeing to it. Some of the Seminole refused to comply, and then a resistance is led by Chief Osceola. They're going to start to attack white forts and settlements, and a war is going to break out between the Americans and the Seminole. Eventually, Osceola himself is tricked into a negotiation under a flag of truce, and when he shows up the negotiation to negotiate with the Americans, he is then imprisoned, and he later dies of a disease. Now, the resistance of the Seminole is going to continue after his death, but most of the Seminole are going to end up being removed by force. A few hundred end up remaining in the reservation area. The U.S. is eventually going to give up trying to remove the Seminole, this is one of the longest and most costly wars in American history, and the Seminole, to my knowledge, are the only Native American tribe that successfully resisted, by force, removal. Everybody else, sooner or later, either gets moved or wiped out. So, let's take a look at Jackson's legacy a little bit, because he is a very controversial figure in American history. He was very much a revered president for many years. He was viewed as a populist president who challenged the political establishment, who stood by his beliefs. His ideas really influenced politics in the United States for decades. And for decades after his presidency, he was the man that politicians claimed that they were following in the footsteps of. He becomes a symbol of American expansion west and he ends up being depicted on the $20 bill. Our current president, Donald Trump, is a big supporter and an admirer of Andrew Jackson. He hung a portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. He was the first president in almost 40 years to visit the Hermitage on the anniversary of Jackson's death, gave a speech. He's certainly a populist president, so he looks to Andrew Jackson as sort of a political model for him to follow. Now, more re recent assessments of Jackson have been much more critical. The critique of him revolves around the fact that he was a strong proponent of slavery. His treatment of Native Americans was harsh. Some say he committed a genocide against Native Americans. There's been a strong movement to replace him on the $20 bill, and this actually gained a lot of traction while President Obama was president, and it looked like he was going to be replaced with Harriet Tubman, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad before the Civil War, who helped lots of slaves escape to the North. It was believed she was going to be replacing him on the $20 bill, and then when President Trump took office, that ended up being kind of sidelined because he's a Jackson supporter. So, last practice, practice number seven, two false statements, change the false statements into true statements. This is going to conclude our lecture on the age of Andrew Jackson.